In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, with only a little more than a week before Christmas, you've probably already started seeing them in your mailbox. Not talking about the flashy ads, pleading with you to go out and fight the crowds and the bad weather to get that great, perfect, last-minute gift. Not talking about the, the spiraling credit card bills that make your checking account go thud. What you've probably seen in your mailbox, or perhaps even in your inbox and your email, is more enjoyable, it's something far better. What I'm talking about are Christmas cards. Christmas letters from friends and loved ones giving updates on their lives. Each one sharing a little bit of good news. A child shares how he got a new toy or, how, or, or what sports she played this past year. A parent shares how the Lord blessed them through a, a big move. Or, or maybe they got a new home or a new job. Or, or maybe the Lord expanded their family with a child or a pet. All these updates. It's good news about family, about jobs, about homes, about <laughs> retirements, about surgery. In a small way, it gives you the opportunity to rejoice with your loved ones and your friends. That time-honored tradition is just one way that we can do something that we really enjoy doing. Sharing good news. Now sometimes that good news is pretty minor, but it makes us smile. And sometimes that good news is life-changing. Sometimes we rejoice right away, while other times it takes a while for the good news to sink in before we finally realize that we can rejoice. So it's only appropriate on this particular Sunday, on the third Sunday in Advent, which historically was known as Gaudete, or Rejoice Sunday, we rejoice at good news that our Savior Jesus comes to share with us. This news is certainly better even than Aunt Mabel's successful surgery or the toys that we got for our birthdays. It's good news. It's the greatest news of all. And so the question I have for you is, are, are you prepared? Are you prepared to hear that good news? Are you prepared to share that good news? Whether you are or you're not, today we have the opportunity to prepare for some good news. Now there's not not much reason to rejoice in a prison cell. There's not much, there, there isn't much reason or, or much good news that comes when you're under the threat of execution. But that's where John the Baptizer found himself. John had boldly proclaimed his message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins to young and old, rich and poor, weak and mighty, even to the puppet king Herod. Calling him out for his very public sin calling him to repent. Sadly, Herod didn't want to hear it. He had no desire whatever to be told that he did something wrong when he actually did. John bothered his conscience. So he had John arrested, thrown into prison, and held over him that constant threat that maybe today is going to be the day when you're going to be beheaded. John needed some good news. Where was he going to find him? You see, John the Baptizer had been sent by the Lord to proclaim good news. He had been sent to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, for God's anointed. That Messiah was to come baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He was to come with glory and judgment, clearing his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now when Jesus of Nazareth came to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness... John didn't hesitate to point out Jesus and say, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's Him. That's the one. But where was the purifying fire? Where was the judgment and cleansing of the world? Where was all the glory? <coughs> Why did it seem like things were getting worse for God's people? I mean, John was in prison. He wasn't out there preparing the way for the Messiah. Why did it seem like things were getting worse for God's people rather than better for the coming of the Messiah? Why was Jesus engaging in a ministry of mercy and healing and forgiveness rather than the judgment and glory that John expected? John knew that Jesus was really the Lamb of God. There was 
He knew that. <coughs> the doubt was starting to creep in. And despair and resignation were not far behind. It even affected John's followers. I mean, Jesus or uh, John had pointed out, this Jesus, he's the coming Savior. And now they're like, really? Is this Jesus the Christ? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Now, John knew he needed some good news. He knew that he needed to be reassured. He knew that his disciples needed to be reassured too. After all of those times, he appointed to Jesus as their Savior. Perhaps if he sent them to Jesus with a couple of questions, maybe that would just subtly push Jesus a little bit closer to being that glorious judge that John expected. Or even if that didn't happen, surely Jesus would give them the good news that they all needed to hear. So when John heard in prison what Jesus, or what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? It was no secret to anyone out there that Herod had thrown John into prison. But as the Almighty God, Jesus knew how bad, how low things had gotten with John. Jesus knew why doubts were creeping into John's mind. Jesus knew how badly John and his followers needed some real good news. So Jesus provided a response. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. What kind of response is that? Wouldn't it just be easier if Jesus just said, yes, I am the Christ? But that's not what John and his followers needed. They didn't need something that simple. They needed to hear the fulfillment of the prophecy. They needed to see the Christ in action, pouring out God's merciful grace on the hurting and the weary and the guilty and the dying. They needed to hear this. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. They needed to hear that Jesus was overcoming the effects of sin. They needed to hear that he was overcoming the consequences of sin in every life. They needed to hear that souls with nothing to offer to the Lord as far as merit or credit or anything were receiving God's forgiveness and unconditional grace through that Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, if John thought he could push Jesus into skipping grace to go right on into glory, Jesus had a very gentle rebuke for him, too. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John, there's no reason to be offended by how I'm saving the world. There's no reason, because of course I am the Lamb of God, but I have to live, I have to suffer, I have to die, and I have to rise again to do that. That good news then has to go out to the world first, and then glory and judgment will come from me. John's disciples left with no more doubt in their minds about who Jesus really was. Are you prepared to hear that good news? There's just so much bad news in our world all the time. Maybe you caught it yesterday, maybe you didn't, but yesterday was the one-year anniversary of the tra tragic shooting in, in Sandy Hook. There was a, a shooting at a school in, in the Denver area this past week. The entire East Coast has been inundated with snow and ice and frozen temperatures. Lawlessness and violence are erupting in countries where we have brothers and sisters in Christ, in places like Ukraine and other countries. They're wondering what's going to happen. And of course, those who are opposed to Christianity and to Christ keep increasing in number and in strength. And there's so much bad news in our own lives. Another death of a loved one or a friend, another divorce, another door of opportunity shut, even another bad year or bad season for your favorite team. There's even bad news in God's Word because it tells us who we really are. Dead, hostile sinners who deserve nothing of mercy and grace from the hand of our God. So then, how often aren't you and I just like John? We know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. I could pull everyone here and you'd say, yes, he's the Lamb of God. And we're not in prison like John, but there's plenty of doubt and despair and resignation to go around, even for the most optimistic Christian. 
Why didn't Jesus make that loved one better in this life? Why didn't God keep that marriage together? Why didn't God keep that door of opportunity open? Why, 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 why? Why didn't God do something about this? Like John, we're tempted to challenge Jesus with that question, why? We're, in a sense, offended by him because he doesn't seem to be as effective as we expect him to be. But he is effective, isn't he? This Jesus does do something about all the bad news in our lives, doesn't he? Okay, he may not have healed that loved one who trusted in him in this life, but he did give them heaven. That's even better. Perhaps he doesn't, uh, he closes one door of opportunity because he has plans for something greater or something unexpected for us. Perhaps he has plans, and, and really it's not a perhaps, it's a surely. Surely he has plans to use that bad news experience, whatever it is in our lives, for our blessing. Maybe for the blessing of others. Maybe even for the blessing of generations after us. Who are we to ask God why? And to demand that he prove to us that he is who he truly is. When he has demonstrated time and time again, His grace and His mercy in action. That's why we need to hear that same gentle rebuke that Jesus gave to John. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Before we get offended by our Lord and His Word, by all the bad news that He seems to bring into our lives, here's some good news. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Consider what you have heard and seen. You were spiritually blind, yet Jesus, through his gospel, opened your eyes through faith to see his glorious grace. You couldn't pick yourself up, so Jesus did. You couldn't cleanse yourself of, the, of sin, so Jesus cleansed you of that sin with his holy precious blood. Jesus opened your eyes, and he opened your ears, and he opened your heart to hear that good news of the gospel, that sweet message of the gospel that doesn't come from anywhere else. He raised you to new life and continues to bring you the good news that you need to hear in your daily doubt and despair. Good news that's not good until you realize, until you realize how desperately and completely you need it directly from him. You have nothing before the Lord, yet the Lord comes to you as a child, as a man, as a sacrifice, as your Savior. He comes to you through His Word. He comes to you through the water and word of holy baptism, taking children and adults into His arms and making them part of His family. He comes to you through the bread and wine, in, with, and under, and through that bread and wine and His Holy Supper, going, here, partake of me. Here's my forgiveness. Here's my life. Here's my salvation for you. Blessed are those who are not offended by such a Savior, but instead realize the need to not only hear His good news, but to share it as well. As John's disciples went away, Jesus praised this last prophet of the Old Testament. John had accomplished exactly what the Lord had sent him to do, to prepare the way before him. To prepare the way with that good news. To get ready, the king is coming. In spite of his looks, John was not an attractive man. He was pretty wild looking. In spite of his way out in the middle of nowhere location, the Lord used him, gave him the best privilege of all, to be the bearer of the best news of all. Good news to prepare the way for the king. So Jesus tells us, I tell you the truth, among those born of women there is not risen anyone greater than John the baptizer. He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Catch that last line? Hear what Jesus is saying there? Even the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the baptizer. Who could that possibly be? Well, friends, he's talking about you and me and every other believer 
since Christ came 2,000 years ago. He said, how are we so privileged, so blessed, so honored? Well, John had been sent to prepare the way for Christ's coming. But we've actually seen Jesus. We've seen him go to the cross for our sins. We've seen him break open the tomb and conquer death. We've seen, Jesus, we've seen the impact of what Jesus has done for us and countless others. We've seen what Jesus has done in our own lives and what he is capable of doing in the lives of every and every heart. We've seen that. John had the task of pointing people ahead to Jesus. But we have the privilege of saying, Jesus came, he comes, and he will come again. Rather than send one prophet, Jesus sends his entire church to proclaim that good news to young and old, to rich and poor, to the weak and the mighty, people we know, people we love, people we don't, so that they all can enjoy the same grace and mercy that we enjoy through this Jesus. If good news in your life is worth sharing with your friends and family, and I say that it is, but why not share the good news of Jesus this Advent and Christmas? Why not invite that struggling loved one or that hurting neighbor or, or that, that grieving friend to come and learn about the child who was born to save us? Why not tell others why Jesus is so important to you? If they don't hear it from you, you cannot assume that they will hear it from anyone else. We can't make that assumption. You don't have to be impressive. John wasn't. You don't have to give a perfect presentation. John had some hard edges around his... He called people brood of vipers. He, he, you know, it wasn't a perfect presentation. You don't even have to be as theologically trained as your pastor. But you know that good news. You've heard that good news. Jesus himself says, Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. You've seen Jesus. You know who He is and what He's done and why He came. Even little ones know about that. You should have seen that yesterday at Christmas for kids. Those kids knew their stuff. And if they didn't, they surely knew it by the time they left. Even little ones know that. So why not share that good news with your adult friends and your teen friends and your kid friends? Why not share with them what's most important in your life Who's most important in your life? Tell them good news about Jesus. Tell them. Proclaim it. Preach that good news. Speak it. Sing it. Shout it. Whisper it if you have to. Share it. Let's tell others what we've seen and heard. Let's give them good news in this bad news world. <clears throat> Let's tell them of Jesus. Amen.